This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Before we begin, those of you who are students in 301, just a friendly reminder of your requirement to write a paper before the end of the quarter. There is, of course, some weeks left. However, there's no time like the present. So uh, please keep that in mind. I have had three or four already, just to let you know that you won't be in bad company. Um, I will pass around with the sign-up sheet this list. I'll just get started here. And uh, just as an introduction, I'm going to discuss these images that I generated uh, to try and market the research a little bit that I'm going to discuss today. Uh, in some of these images, you can see in this first one, what I'm showing is a combustion plume from coal combustion. And we're looking at mercury being released from the combustion. And then, as you all know, you've heard warnings about fish and mercury in the fish and contaminating fish and things like this. And so what we're trying to do in our work is understand the speciation of mercury in addition to other trace elements in the combustion gases um, of coal. And trying to understand the speciation will allow us to prevent the release from coal combustion. So that's one of the aims of my research. And in this picture, you can see a little periodic table with arsenic and selenium, also trace elements that are released from coal combustion and can get admitted into the atmosphere and can affect livestock. The image off to the left here is a couple of things. When you think about coal combustion, there's actually a lot of byproducts that are waste materials that have to be landfilled. And we'll talk about more of those today a little bit. And when you think about it, and you think about the life cycle assessment of the entire process of burning coal and gaining electricity, each of those processes, if you want to try and minimize the environmental impacts, you really have to understand you know, how those materials are going to be landfilled, or, or can they be recycled to prevent landfilling. And so what we show here in the wall board, calcium oxide is a byproduct of coal combustion because it's used to capture sulfur dioxide in wet chemical scrubbers. And so this, you can see the trouble with that as an unintended consequence is that there might be trace elements additionally in the wall board that's used or that's made from the recycling of the calcium materials. Similarly, in the floor here, as you can see, it's a concrete floor, and you can see that there's this activated carbon that's kind of cracking it. Activated carbon is used in coal combustion to adsorb mercury, to prevent it from being released into the atmosphere. Typically, fly ash is a byproduct of coal combustion, and fly ash is sold uh, by utility boilers to uh, asphalt companies. So to make asphalt stronger, you can add fly ash to it. The problem is, is you, if you have injected activated carbon in the system to capture mercury, what happens when you try to sell the fly ash to make concrete, it actually uh, creates this cracking and uh, compromises the strength of the concrete. And so now you're looking at wallboard potentially with trace elements in it, and you're looking at concrete potentially with activated carbon in it. So you're essentially compromising the integrity and the sellability or saleability of those materials. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, throughout the talk today. I have to get rid of this thing here. No, that wasn't it. <laughs> Maybe if you close, if you go up and close it. I had the wrong one. That's okay. You got it. Okay, I think that's good enough. So just an outline. Essentially, at the beginning, we're going to try and just discuss a little bit about global coal use. We'll talk about trace element speciation, trace element capture, and also separation mem membranes um, for carbon dioxide and hydrogen separation. So these are three main areas of research that I carry out in my research group. Worldwide, fossil fuels account for 80% of the energy demand. 
Uh, 52 percent of the electricity generated in the United States is from coal. The U.S. produces 1.5 billion tons per year of carbon dioxide from burning coal. Uh, China is constructing the equivalent of two 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants each week, which is the capacity comparable to the U.K. power grid each year. So this is a pretty large amount. China and India are projected to account for 68 percent of the demand in the world coal through uh, 2030. So this kind of just gives you an indication that, you know, we're not looking at being huge supporters of coal, but what it's looking at is that in the transition of considering alternative energies, such as solar-based or, you know, newer batteries, um, wind power, things like this, coal's not really going to go anywhere. And so we need to try and minimize the environmental impacts associated with it as we're going through this transitional phase into alternative energy uh, sources. And especially with, you know, countries like India and China, where the reserves for coal are so high, it's inevitable that it's going to be in our future. Government and policy associated with the United States, uh, the Clean Air Act, 1990, has looked at a, a cap and trade of SOx and NOx emissions. Clean Air Interstate Rule is looking at um, throughout 28 eastern states of SOx and NOx. CAMR is the Clean Air Mercury Rule, which was established in 2005 but recently vacated in February 2008. And what this was is looking at a cap on the mercury emissions. And it's important to note that the U.S. emits 50 tons per year on average of mercury from coal combustion. And that sounds like a large number, but in fact, worldwide, there's 5,000 tons of mercury emitted in the atmosphere from coal combustion. So China and India are really a large proponent of this. And, uh, and the U.S. has really tried to establish regulations for these mercury emissions, but recently this was vacated. But there's still 24, 26 <coughs> states that have regulations on mercury emissions. So right now there's a big push for combustion utility boilers to limit and prevent mercury from being released in the atmosphere, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to discuss. One of the things I try and do in my group uh, is to try and always connect the broader scale of the work to both industry and government, and not just academia, and not just the U.S., but also to have collaborations international. And so we're working with a few groups. We're working with a group at Okayama University uh, looking at life cycle assessment of some of these byproducts and trying to minimize the environmental impacts associated with combustion of coal. And we're also looking at um, a group at Chula Longhorn and another catalysis group at the National University of Singapore. And some of the collaborations that we have are through Department of Energy and EPA so that we're always aware of what those regulations are and also the experiments and the theoretical calculations that are taking place from the researchers at those institutions as well and to always kind of keep a connection of these relationships. And in addition, uh, we just recently established a connection with um, Electric Power Research Institute, which is pretty close here to Stanford, and, uh, and essentially just working with that industry to try and look at sorbents for mercury capture and then to try and scale up to the pilot scale systems. So some of the research um, that I'm going to discuss is going to be based upon both gasification and combustion. And this is going to be a common theme that I'm going to tie throughout the presentation today, is this duality here. So you can have coal at the start, but the question is, do you want to gasify the coal or do you want to combust the coal? And really, what's the difference in each of these techniques? How is it going to affect the speciation in the flue gas or fuel gas if you're gasifying? And then also, how is that going to affect the design of the sorbent material to capture these trace elements? Uh, and then also, gasification versus combustion can affect how you might sequester or capture the carbon dioxide from your emissions as well. So one thing to keep in mind is something called uh, combined cycle design. So when you have gasification, what happens is you create a synthesis gas. And that synthesis gas essentially looks like a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And so with gasification, what you end up doing is you end up cleaning that pre-combustion. So in gasification, there's a combustion stage, but the cleaning happens before. So you are gasifying the coal, but with essentially less than half of the amount of oxygen you would in a combustion process. So it's a lot less oxygen when you're gasifying. So you're not reaching that full combustion that you would when you were actually um, adding excess oxygen. And so with gasification, what you can do is you create these gas species, 
you clean it, and then at that point you have this clean syngas of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and there's a, a series of things that you can do with that that I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, but mostly what I want to talk about now is that in a gasification environment, what I just said, we have less oxygen. So if there's less oxygen, it's really the environment looks like a reducing environment. And so that reducing environment is really going to control you know, the speciation of what's going to happen when you combust the coal. And so that's what we're going to look at. And coal combustion, it's an oxidizing environment. So that's going to also influence. And so you can see here what I've mentioned before is we're really focusing in, in my research on the trace elements. Um, there, are, there are a lot of combustion modelers out there that have looked at the hydrocarbons and have developed a lot of models for those. But primarily, we're interested in mercury, arsenic, and selenium. And I've highlighted the ones in blue here. The reason why I've done that is because they're water soluble. So it gives us an idea of how these things can cycle in the atmosphere. So these are primarily the species that are known from previous investigations to be released from coal or from gasification processes or combustion processes. And the blue ones are the ones that are water soluble. So you can imagine that's how they can get into um, you know, atmospheric cycling into the environment. So what we've done is we're looking at kinetic <coughs> modeling of the actual combustion process. So you have a boiler with a flame, and you're essentially burning the coal. And you might ask, well, where does the mercury come from? Where do these trace elements come from? When coal is mined out of the ground, there's going to be a lot of other things in the earth. And so since mercury and arsenic and selenium are all naturally present in the Earth's crust, and you know, coal is very old, then naturally these trace elements are going to exist in that rock as well. And so when you burn it, these things are going to essentially come out. Uh, so when you have combustion, what you end up having, having in the boiler, you don't, get, you don't always get full combustion of the carbon material. That's called loss on ignition. That means that the carbon, depending on um, or the coal, depending on the rank, uh, will burn all the way or it might not. So inside that boiler, you have unburned carbon. You also have fly ash. So fly ash are alumina or silica-based uh, materials that aren't going to burn either. So you have trace elements, alumina, silica, all of these things flying around in that boiler environment. And what that does is it creates surfaces for reactions to happen on. So it's a very complex environment in which you have heterogeneous catalysis and you have homogeneous kinetics happening. And so what we're trying to do is look at both of these pathways. But of course, what do we do? We always start with the easiest to try and figure out if that's a dominating pathway or not. And so what we've done is we've looked at the homogeneous pathway. One thing to keep in mind is that and I've mentioned this previously is that when you oxidize mercury with chlorine, it's water soluble. So HgCl2, just like in that previous slide that I showed of water soluble, it's water soluble. So what that means is, if you create a species that's water soluble, it means that we can capture it in solution easily. The problem is, is with combustion, you end up getting elemental mercury oftentimes, which is not water soluble and it's difficult to capture. So there's the trouble. And so if we can figure out a way to oxidize this mercury to make it into that water-soluble form, then we can enhance the capture of it and prevent it from being released in the atmosphere. So that's kind of the goal. So this looks familiar if you've taken an introductory chemistry class, right? And so what we're doing is looking at a series of reactions. This is a bimolecular reaction, but we also look at unimolecular reactions where you just have one species breaking apart. And so what we end up doing is we calculate, and if you're a chemical engineer, oftentimes you're given these parameters. You know, you, you might use some uh, differential equation solver. You have a reaction uh, design equation, and you input parameters such as activation energies and rate constants, but you don't know where they come from. But if you're a chemist, you actually design or calculate those rate constant and activation energies. So the interesting part of this work is it's really bridging chemistry and chemical engineering a little bit. So it's giving us the background of where do these Ks come from? Where do these activation energies come from? And the work that I'm doing, we're not measuring them in the lab. We're actually calculating them from theory. The theory is called ab initio, and it means first principles. So we actually start really with first principles, with the wave equation. And we solve approximations to the wave equation. 
And if anybody's interested, I can tell you more details later. Some of the software that we use, Gaussian and MolePro, and these are, uh, when you're looking at running one of these calculations, what you're really doing is you're solving for the electronic energy of the system. And so there's a series of things that we need to go through, a series of steps. Oftentimes, especially for the mercury, the arsenic, and selenium, there's really just not any data available, kinetic data for these. So if you're trying to solve these differential equations with rate constants and activation energies, it doesn't exist. So what you end up having to do is validate the level of theory that you choose so you can actually trust the predictions that you're making from theory. And I'll show you an example of one of our potential energy surfaces, um, which we use to gain that information. So activation energies we get from potential energy surfaces, rate constants we get from chemical kinetic tools, such as transition state theory, variational, uh, and also Rice, Ramsberger, Castle, and Marcus, which is just RKM. When you have a unimolecular reaction, this is essentially the algorithm that you use. For bimolecular reactions, you just are using transition state theory, which is a very conventional approach. I'm not going to go into any details of that. Just to give you an idea of what these potential energy surfaces look like, so what you have to do is start from the beginning. You have a series of reactions, and you have to understand what are the mechanisms happening. And you can imagine when you have a surface, it's even more complicated. But just if you have gas phase kinetics, we just look at a series of reactions, and we have to understand what bonds are forming and what bonds are breaking. And those are our degrees of freedom in the system. And we essentially are making an energy plot. On the energy plot, you have potential wells that pertain to the reaction species and the product species. And then, as you can imagine, you have to go along some minimum energy path that brings you from one to the next by overcoming an activation barrier. Now, this really dominates the kinetics, this barrier. So if the barrier is high you know, versus a low barrier, that's going to essentially dominate the pathways that are happening. But we can't get confused. We remember that these are really rate constants, and the rate is proportional to that. But really what matters is the concentration of the species available. So we can't forget that aspect as well. Um, but this is just an idea of that. And we've, we've been able to generate a series of rate constants for the mercury chlorine. But in the end, the question becomes, you know, is, homogeneous, uh, is the homogeneous pathway the one, or is it a heterogeneous pathway? And that's what we're really trying to figure out here. And so what we've done here is we've looked at a series of 376 different reactions. And now, as you saw, you, there was only about 12 mercury chlorine reactions. So the rest are hydrocarbon, chlorine submechanisms, um, SOX and NOX reactions that have already been calculated, and they're already existing in combustion libraries. And so what we're looking at is adding a series of mercury chlorine. And we've collaborated with Reaction Engineering International um, and Andrew Fry at Reaction Engineering International. And um, what we found, and this is just a rough outline <clears throat> to give you an idea, and what Andrew was doing at the University of Utah in the combustion group there is he was simulating the flue gases using um, burning methane in air, and he generated all these mercury rate constants. And so what we did is we were just using pure quantum mechanical calculations. And so then in the end, what we've done is we've compared the speciation of mercury in simulated flue gases against the quantum mechanical calculations. And this tells you two interesting things. First, it tells you, wow, we're not disagreeing by too much here. And then granted, this is a rough you know, graph without error bars and things like that, but it's to just give you an idea. And we were doing this in isolation. It wasn't until later that I found out that these, these experiments were actually ongoing while I was carrying out the calculations. Uh, but what we found, the second interesting aspect is what we're finding is, is that the amount of mercury that's oxidized is less than 10%. So we've gone back, we think about our question again, and what's happening is in the flue gases, you actually have you know, the heterogeneous pathway, which is dominating. So now the steps are to go through and calculate rate constants associated with simula simulated activated carbon surfaces and to try and create a more accurate model. And you might ask, why? Why do we want to do all of this? What is the importance behind this? And the importance behind it is because when you look at a real plant system, this is an example of one without mercury capture. So 
you know, the U.S., there are a lot of these plants that are out there, traditional pulverized coal combustion plants, and they do not have mercury capture technology associated with them. They have other things, though. So when you have, you know, you have the high temperature of the boiler, and then you have the start of something called a quench zone here. And so what that means is, is throughout each of these processes in the power plant, you have cooling happening of the flue gases. And that's where all the interesting chemistry happens with mercury. In fact, as the flue gases cool, that's how the oxidation happens. So in these high temperatures, it's mostly that elemental mercury. And then as oxidation happens, it becomes HgCl2. And then you see here, this is called a flue gas desulfurization. That's that calcium-based material that's used for sulfur dioxide capture. And so in that same system, because it's a wet flue gas desulfurization process, it captures the oxidized mercury, which is water soluble. Another way to capture it is the electrostatic precipitator is a unit in the power plant that captures particulate matter. So it captures things like unburned carbon and fly ash. And remember I said before in the introduction, those, those particulates then get recycled to make, fly, to make uh, asphalt. Uh, and so what happens is mercury can become particulate bound. So it can go on the surfaces of those particulates and get captured in this system as well. So these things are called co-benefits. But the key to all of this is, is that a power plant will go to a consulting company like Reaction Engineering International, and they'll ask them, what do we need to do to make sure that we don't have our mercury being released at this amount? What can we do to cut our mercury emissions? You know, what can we do to minimize the cost of retrofitting our system to cut mercury emissions? That's the question they ask. And so what the consulting company needs to do is they need to model their system. And they need to be able to put in rate constants and things like that in order to do that effectively and accurately so that they can then go back to the combustion plant and say, here's how we retrofit. But you're lucky you have an SO2 scrubber so you don't have to spend much money this year. Maybe next year when the you know, when you have to regulate further, maybe you might have to put in something like an injected activated carbon system to capture the mercury. So that's the idea behind this, behind this work. One thing that we're looking at is kind of the next wave. As I mentioned before, the goal is, is to try and maximize the oxidation of mercury because it's water soluble and that means it can be captured. So there's been additional investigations on actually pre-washing the coal with bromine solution or injecting activated carbon with bromine on the surface to enhance mercury oxidation and capture. Because it turns out that bromine is actually a better oxidizer than, oxidizer than chlorine, but it's not present at the same levels in the flue gas as chlorine. So now this is a new area that we're looking into to try and enhance the oxidation further with bromine addition. In addition to the theory that, that we uh, are carrying out and all those rate constants in, that we're calculating, we also have an experimental system uh, that's in transit right now from Massachusetts. As Roland mentioned, I just started about, you know, not that long ago. So it's still kind of getting set up in the lab. But what we're looking at is very similar to the system at the University of Utah from Andrew Fry's uh, PhD. And so what we have is we're burning methane in air. And then what we have is a, we have a flame where we're able to pass chlorine through the flame to create chlorine radicals. So we're able to actually simulate that environment. We can do the same with bromine. And uh, we're going to look at both a combustion environment and a gasification environment. But right now, our system's set up to do combustion. And the nice thing is, is inside our furnace, we can have different reactors. Right now, we just have a flow reactor. But we're going to look at an entrained flow reactor later so that we can look at actual particulate bound interactions and in surface kinetics. And this is just a picture. Um, you can't see it very well. Uh, this is our furnace here, and I'll show some better pictures of our measurement device, uh, which we designed. When I was in grad school, I actually built one of these, actually, uh, as part of my PhD. And it was a bunch of you know, old Extrel ABB mass spec equipment that was put into a pile back in the 80s that was essentially designated junk. And, uh, and so I got it up and running again. And so then I was pretty happy when I actually got my first assistant professor job because it meant that I had a startup package and I didn't have to make it again. I actually got to work with a, a company to make it with me. And so that's what we've done. And so this is a system that was built by Extrel. And uh, we have electron ionization happening. 
right here at the source. Um, this is essentially where you're sampling for collisions, so you can actually measure your products from your combustion, uh, simulated combustion flue gas. The next thing that I'm going to discuss briefly is the trace element capture. And I've mentioned this already a little bit. So the idea behind gasification versus combustion is that there's a cleaning process happening. So the first step with gasification is, again, less than half of the oxygen. And then, so you're essentially gasifying your coal with um, the products being carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And then at that point, uh, there are a number of steps that can happen. I want to first just talk quickly about combined cycle and what that means, because it is important to note that the gasification process is a more efficient process than combustion. And the reason why that is, is because when you're, when you're looking at gasification, there's a step where you can actually extract some of the heat from that gasification reaction. And you can take that heat, create steam, to create a steam turbine um, system so that you can actually gain more electricity that way. So you're actually capturing some of the heat from the system. Uh, the other part is, is that you can do different things with the syngas. You can take the syngas if you have a turbine that's equipped to handle syngas, a burner that's equipped within the turbine to handle the syngas, then you can actually create electricity from the syngas. So you actually have electricity being created from a turbine that's running on the syngas, and, or it could be running on hydrogen of the syngas, or you have a turbine that's, and you have a turbine that's running on the steam generated from that excess heat from the process. So that's why it's called combined cycle. And oftentimes you see it as IGCC, an integrated gasification combined cycle. And that's what that means. Uh, another option is, is when you have that carbon monoxide and hydrogen can be combined with steam, and that's called the water gas shift reaction. So what you're doing is you're taking that syngas, you're adding steam to it, and you're enhancing that forward production of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Uh, and this is related to the next project that I'm going to talk about a little bit, just briefly, a few slides. And looking at when you get this system, when you have hydrogen and CO2, you can imagine if you have a membrane or a way that you can effectively separate these two things, that could be a good thing, right? Because you can think about CO2 sequestration. Another application is fissure trope liquids. So there's this whole push on coal to liquids as well. If this is the resource we have, why not try and make oil from coal? And so another push is to say, well, if you've got carbon monoxide and hydrogen, iron or cobalt-based catalysts can be studied to enhance that production of liquid from that syngas. So that's another area. The, one, the things that we need to keep in, in, in mind here when we think about combustion or gasification when we're designing sorbent materials couple of things. One is currently what's happening is you've got the syngas, right, and that's a high temperature because you've just gone through that gasification process. And so, and now you've got, to, you've got to clean it before you burn it, right? You've got to clean it before you run it through the turbines. That's the whole point of, you know, the, the politician that's trying to sell cleaner coal or whatever they want to say with IGCC. The whole point is, is that you want to try and burn clean syngas. And so to clean the process is expensive, though. And why it's expensive is because you've got to remove trace elements like mercury, and you've also got to remove sulfur. And so to remove sulfur, the best way to do it is at low temperatures. And same with mercury. Activated carbon only works at low temperatures. So if you've got a hot syngas, in order to capture sulfur and trace elements, you've got to cool it first. That takes a lot of energy. So there you go. You've got to feed in more coal to get the same energy out. If you could come up with a way to capture sulfur and mercury at elevated temperatures, you wouldn't have to cool it. You save a lot of money. So that's you know, a huge push in research that's happening. Elevated temperature methods for sulfur capture and mercury capture. So activated carbon breaks down at high temperatures. You can't use it anymore. So one of the things we're looking at is using metals to separate mercury. And so that's what I'm going to discuss briefly. Additionally, as I mentioned at the beginning in the introduction, when you have coal combustion, remember you're trying to minimize the waste associated with the process. So you want to be able to sell the fly ash to an asphalt company. You want to be able to sell the calcium oxides from the wet FGD scrubbers to a wallboard manufacturer that will modify it from gypsum. 
So you want to be able to sell these things so you don't have to put them into landfills. But the problem is, is you don't know what happens to the trace elements in the process or the activated carbon. And so what we're trying to do is um, develop novel sorbents for capturing these, these species. And so the program that we use is a Vienna ab initio simulation package. And so it's nice if you have a surface that's periodic. So before, we were just talking gas phase kinetics, small molecules, small interactions, electronic interactions. Here, we're looking at actual surfaces, and we're considering adsorption on the surfaces and catalysis on the surfaces. And so this is really nice because we can apply periodic boundary conditions, uh, and we can actually look at uh, large surfaces. And so just some examples. This is a calcium oxide surface, and again, that's what the, the sulfur, material, sulfur capture material is made of. And, uh, and so we're just looking at a comparison of sulfur dioxide adsorption, mercuric chloride, and then the water-soluble mercuric chloride and a mercuric oxide adsorption. And what we're doing is we go through and we're calculating, the first step is really this one, and that's to calculate stable geometries on the surface to try and understand the strengths of binding on the surface. You want to try and, in this case, if we're trying to sell the calcium oxide to a gypsum plant to make wallboard, you want to maybe minimize the interaction of mercury in there, or maybe you want to maximize it, but you've got to be careful because you don't want it to ever leach out of the process, so it really has to be stuck in there. So you really want to be able to understand you know, the adsorption strengths of these materials on the surface, which is kind of the goal of our, of our work. Uh, and for the gasification application, what we're looking at, it's an expensive material, but it's a palladium base. And, uh, and a gold. So we're looking at palladium gold alloys for mercury capture. And this came about, the idea for this came about, you've heard of you know, mercury being tied up in gold when you have gold mining processes. Mercury is one of the huge emissions from gold mining. And that's because mercury and gold are correlated in the, in the earth together. And so we thought, well, if that's true, maybe gold might be a good way to separate it and capture mercury in this process. And the nice thing about things like palladium and gold is they can withstand high temperatures. And all you have to do is you have to heat these things in order to get the mercury vapor off. So there, is ways to re there are ways to regenerate the materials so that they can be reused. And so what we're doing now is we're looking at studies in which we found, in fact, that how much gold you add to the palladium influences the strength of that adsorption. So you can imagine trying this experimentally and having to look at all these possible composition combinations, and it would be really expensive. The nice thing about the computations is that it's a model, and you can just replace it and replace it. And you can, you can run it, and you can go away and come back and see what happens and analyze your results. It's, it's, it, it's pretty nice. But in the end, what it gives you is it gives you an indication of what may be true, you know, so that you can go to the experimentalist, and you can say, hey, here's an idea. Try this composition. It might work. So it's more like it's providing intuition into the lab. Last thing I'm going to discuss is looking at, again, IGCC. With IGCC, you have the carbon dioxide and hydrogen if it passes through that water gas shift uh, reactor, right? Because you had carbon monoxide and hydrogen passed across the water gas shift. You get further um, CO2 and hydrogen production. So once you get this stream, if you have a way to separate hydrogen selectively from that mixture, then you can take the CO2 and sequester it. So the idea is to come up with an effective and affordable method for the separation of these two. So what we do, and again, the work that we've done so far is really based upon palladium materials. And so what this is is a lattice, and what it turns out that hydrogen is only happy in two spots in this lattice, an octahedral site and a tetrahedral site. And so what we do is we're actually calculating binding energies of hydrogen inside the system to figure out solubilities of the material to hydrogen. And this is just a series of steps that we go through to calculate um, solubility with relationship to binding energies. And in the end, what we can find is we can again figure out, this is an example of an alloy taking palladium and alloying it with silver. And we can readily see here, these are binding energies which are directly proportional to the solubility of hydrogen in these materials. So we're able to then pinpoint exactly what kind of compositions can maximize solubility. And so that's what this can do for us. And this is just a validation of our model. Um, in the end, what we found is, 
Now, what, what's interesting to note is with these surfaces, they're perfect. But in reality, we know that these surfaces aren't perfect. There's edge sites, there's step sites, there's terraces. Surface analysis is, is really complicated with these things in reality. But what we are finding compared to experiments is that the trends are accurate. In other words, in this case, you can see that when we alloy palladium with 25% silver, we get maximum solubility, which is about the same as the maximum with the experiments. And so at least we can go to the experimentalist and say, Let's, here's the recipe. Here's what we want to try and make, and then test it in the lab. Now, if you're trying to calculate permeability, which is the key to taking a membrane and selectively separating hydrogen from that CO2 hydrogen mix, we need the other half of the story, which is diffusivity. So the solubility will tell you half of it, but the product of the two gives you the permeability information. And the permeability information is crucial to understanding uh, the behavior of the membrane. And so how we do that? Again, there's just the octahedral and tetrahedral sites. And so hydrogen hops essentially through these two sites via a transition state. And it's transition state theory that we use to calculate the activation energies associated with each of those hops. And so what we do then, at that point, we can use kinetic Monte Carlo. Kinetic Monte Carlo, all, of, all that's saying is just saying that the path of how these things are moving is directly proportional to those activation energies. So the higher the barrier, the less likely it's going to move in that direction. And so we can, in the end, figure out the pathway, the likely pathway that the hydrogen is going to take throughout the system. And as you can imagine, when we look at the activation energies, you can see here, you know, the higher you've got, the higher the barrier, the less likely you're going to have hydrogen moving through that area. So chances are this isn't the kind of composition that you would want. But again, it gives the experimentalists an idea of what kind of compositions you would like to maximize you know, the diffusivity of hydrogen through the material. So the permeabilities. In the end, and this is just a comparison to experiments to show again that the trends are the same as experiments to validate. And in the end, what's important to note is that the permeability is a function or the product of both the diffusivity and the solubility. The solubility, if something's holding on tight, it's not going to diffuse very easily through. So it's a balance of these two properties. And what this has shown is that, for instance, for palladium gold, you've got this mixture. 12 times higher than pure palladium in terms of solubility. In total permeability, we're getting three to four times with palladium silver alloys. Uh, but in the end, what this tells us is that these things are expensive. Look at the cost. If you look at iron, for instance, $5.50 per ounce. And you look at gold, $911, palladium, $384. These are pretty expensive materials. So right now, what we're doing is we're trying to look at combining these two processes, the water gas shift, so you have a material in which that water gas shift reaction happens on the surface, and then you get enhanced adsorption and diffusivity of hydrogen throughout as well. So that's what we're looking at now. And we're trying to look at alternative materials in addition to that. And so I just want to give thanks to uh, the PhD candidates whose work I, I discussed today, Erdem and Biter, and Tarumi, who's back in Massachusetts, and then um, Sheila Abood, my research associate, and Andrew Fry from Reaction Engineering International. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to imagine the surface of the material that the hydrogen permeating through. Is this a, a porous gold material? Is it gold over a lattice? Uh, what happens is you have a you have a stainless a porous stainless steel support, and then and that's the support material, and so you have a gas stream on the inside that will imagine a tube, and so you have um, a mix of the palladium's uh, actually there's a layer so you have the stainless steel support which is porous so the gas can go through that easily but the palladium itself it's this lattice. There's interstitial sites, so there's spacing inside the material. It's not, it's not porous. There's spacing inside the material that the hydrogen fits through. So there are sites within inter, called interstitial sites that it can actually hop and move throughout. It's not CO2 wouldn't be able to do that, for instance. It's too large, so hydrogen is able to move through. So you have high pressure CO2 and hydrogen on one side. Exactly. And 
and so you have that gradient as well. And you have, the, you have palladium, and if you, you know, if you look at the adsorption, dissociative adsorption uh, kinetics of H2 on palladium, it happens really easily. Like the activation barrier for that reaction is very, very small. And so, but when you look at other materials other than palladium, like copper, for instance, it's, it doesn't happen as well. So for instance, if you had pure copper, the lattice constant for copper, you know, that's the spacing between the, the atoms in the lattice is very small, it's small compared to palladium. So you kind of need that spacing. So H2 does not dissociate as well on like pure copper and certainly does not diffuse through very well pure copper, but it does through palladium. And what we're looking at, the reason why it works so much better on gold and uh, silver alloys is because you're stretching that lattice. So you're providing even more room for that hydrogen to move through. You know, so yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, if you built a dirty plant, how difficult is it to replicate? And is, it, is this something that has to be done to have a plan for have a So if, if, in other words, if it's one of these old coal plants, how much effort is it going to take to retrofit it for cleaning? Just when the Chinese plants are going on. Mm hmm you know, I, it's expensive to retrofit, but there are a lot of companies trying to optimize the costs associated with retrofitting because it's having to happen in the U.S. too. The average life of coal plants is about 55 years. And so in the U.S., there are a lot of coal plants that were built, you know, some years ago that, that in which SOx and NOx emissions weren't, you know, regulated at that time. So there's a lot of, you, that's essentially what REI does in some of these consulting companies is to try and understand how much that's going to cost. You know, but it really depends on the type of coal that's being burned. So depending on the coal rank, some coal is dirtier than others. Some coal has a lot of sulfur, so you have to have those flue gas desulfurization systems in place. If you, if you use something like, if you've heard of oxyfuel firing, for instance, um, what that means is, is that you're, you're looking at putting in more, a more pure stream of oxygen so that you don't have as much nitrogen there, like when you feed in air. So when you do that, you're reducing, you can reduce your NOx emissions quite a bit if you're feeding in, but then that costs money because you need an air separator. So there are some, you know, so there are some issues with that, um, but it really depends on the conditions of the coal, you know, that you're actually trying to, trying to, to burn. Uh, I think it's expensive to retrofit them, but I don't know. I think it also probably depends on the policy that's in China on, on trying to, regulate the SOx and NOx and, and mercury emissions, and I don't know what those are, if any, are in place, so. Yeah. So uh, in the sum of the best possible scenario, what kind of cost differential do you be able to see between what we have as a standard plan today versus enabling some of this technology, best scenario? Yeah. Um, well, last, I think last April, MIT put out a report called The Future of Coal. And it's like, you know, whatever, 128 pages of, and in the end they do a cost of electricity, you know, for looking at gasification versus traditional pulverized coal combustion, uh, looking at CC, you know, carbon capture and sequestration versus not. and. In the end, their, their story that they tell is that with you, when you look at integrated uh, gasification combined cycle, IGCC, uh, with CCS, so with carbon capture sequestration, it's, it's cheaper. You know, so right now, if we think about, it's, it's weird because you think about in the United States what's happening right now is there's not a big push actually for gasification plants and I don't think there's a big push in China even though there's a lot of research going on. Um, but in the end, the story that they say, just to try and answer your question, but I don't know the numbers, I don't remember the actual um, you know, cost per you know, watt or whatever it is, but the IGCC in the end was kind of what they were saying was going to be cheaper if you consider carbon capture and sequestration. And I feel like you know, that's kind of the point of gasification a little bit is you've got that efficiency, but you also are producing this CO2 hydrogen stream in the end. And if you have a way to separate them, then you can have a way to generate this compressed CO2 gas stream. 
which makes it easier to capture, you know, versus right now with pulverized coal combustion and the separation processes associated with that they're having to go through now with it, which I, I don't know a lot about. But so I, I don't know the exact numbers of the cost difference, but I think in the end that report concluded that IGCC, if you're including CCS, is the is kind of the cheapest route in the end because the efficiency. Yeah. Right now in the United States, we only have one IGCC plan and only two or three in the plan. We've all heard how clean they're supposed to be. But in reality, how much are these existing plans and one's plan really going to capture these trace elements and, and yeah. how clean really are they going to be? Um, I think it all comes down to cost, which is why I'm getting to do this research. You know, so uh, there are the current plants, the, the current gasification plants in the U.S. now, there are a lot, but they're not for power generation. They're for other, they're for products, you know. So, for instance, you know, the Dasani plastic Coke bottles that we all drink out of there, the water bottles, those are made from coal. You know, so when you make a product like that, you've got to make sure that you get the mercury out. You know, you've got to make sure that you get the sulfur out. And so what they do is they spend a ton of money on cooling down the syngas. Then they burn the syngas clean, see? But they have the money to do that. Now, when we're paying electricity, you know, we may not be excited to pay extra costs knowing, I mean, I don't know. It all depends on, you know, these things that I can't control. Um, but, you know, the, I, the idea is, is that we've got to come up with more affordable ways to clean that gas than to, by cooling it. So I think when, you know, we develop the catalysts and the sorbents so that you can actually clean out the sulfur and clean out the trace elements at high temperatures, then you're making it a more affordable process, you know. So then I still have a job, which is good, right? Yeah. Many ignorant will tell us about the trace elements concentration in gasification plants. So I think that's the problem. Yeah. 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 From coal and doing material balances throughout the whole system. So those data are available in open literature. Mm -hmm. But in, my, in, in, the, in the work, that work for the concentration of mercury in, in the synthesis gas was in the parts per billion range. That's right. And now, when you're trying to reduce it to what level, what are your targets in terms of trying to accomplish something with the palladium, silver, or palladium gold? Uh, uh, material. Is it, is, are you after a little of the list? Uh, now, the census gas itself can have no mercury because the catalyst used to develop uh, fish truck liquids would be really out there. So it's already moved on the end of the little chain of steps that take place. So I, I fail to see the purpose of the gasification work. Other than well, the labor work is very interesting. Can you explain that? Okay, let me. There were a couple of things there. Um, the second one that you mentioned, uh, the Fisher trope. Now, that happens. These catalysts, iron based catalysts or cobalt based catalysts for Fisher trope, they would be poisoned by sulfur, for instance. Well, there's not a lot of mercury there, like you mentioned. It's in the parts per billion. But there's a lot of sulfur. The sulfur is in parts per million like, you know, three to 500 parts per million. So the key really is mercury is not going to compete with, you know, it's not going to compete at those low concentrations with hydrogen and carbon monoxide on a, on a catalyst surface. But sulfur will, and sulfur poisoning is an issue. Uh, and so the goal with this gasification is that you have elevated, at that high temperature during the gasification process, that's before you go through Fisher trope. So that's the first stage. That's the stage where you clean it. So you're cleaning that gas, that syngas that you created. Then you use it for those different processes. Um, but the idea is to try and clean it at elevated temperatures so that you don't have to cool it and then heat it back up to burn it, right? Or to use it for another purpose like Fisher trope. But then you mentioned something else before, too. The first question, what was that? I feel like you asked a couple of things. Did that answer your question? Oh, OK, great. Nice. OK. Any others? Yeah. How much does the cleanup contribute to the cost of hydrogen today? Because it's coming from natural gas, presumably that's cleaner to start with. But it still has CO2 at the end of the water gas ship. So that's got to come 
Oh, so you're asking how clean is, if it could, if all was great, how clean is this compared to natural gas? No, no, I'm asking how much does the current price of hydrogen, which is not cheap, mm -hmm. um, come from this process you're trying to replace, which is a low temperature purification of hydrogen away from CO2, I believe. I mean, in the current technology, you know, we're making hydrogen from it's CO2 yeah. and hydrogen. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the, the comparison would be. Actually, I'm not sure. Um, the reason I bring it up yeah. is because then you put a, a, a window on that one unit operation, which you, which is which you're trying to avoid, which is go to low temperature purified and back up. Mm -hmm. and, and and there's already a lot of production. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I think it's doing maybe it's so are you saying um, when it's Dirty to try and separate the hydrogen at that stage, or I guess I missed some of that. Well, this purification is commercially is being practiced commercially today, mm -hmm. in huge volumes, and they that the product is so quite expensive, we wouldn't want to run our cars on even the price of hydrogen today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, so it's, kind it of might like, be a big fraction of the cost of hydrogen. I just don't know. I see what you're saying. So, yeah, what's what's the cost of hydrogen production in the end from this? Necessarily, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I do know, though, one thing you could look into to find that is on the Department of Energy website. Um, they have a huge hydrogen initiative. I don't know if there's any information there. There's the Future Gen, you know, this huge project that was supposed to be all about gasification that just changed in January 2008, and now it's looking at CCS. You know, so it's looking at CC carbon capture and sequestration uh, with coal gasification. And you can imagine hydrogen production comes from that is a way to think about it. But the thing is, because you've got your CO2 and your hydrogen or your CO and your hydrogen, and you can make, you know, you can make hydrogen when you have a membrane to separate it or even a polymer-based uh, carbon dioxide selective membrane to separate it, whatever you want to use. But they're actually focusing on turbines to look at um, electricity production from the hydrogen, so using it right away not for like transportation fuels or selling it for ammonia plants or you know whatever they're actually looking at it you know in this future gen project which is heavily funded and kind of has taken a different turn than pure gasification it's taken a turn towards carbon capture sequestration but they're looking at this kind of closed process in which they get the sequestration but it's all about producing electricity from that plant you know what i mean not like making hydrogen and selling it for you know um, refueling stations for transportation and things like that Whereas the hydrogen initiative is all about that, you know. So that might be a good resource to find that. But okay. All right. I think we'll leave it that. Just to remind you, next week will be biofuels. And, uh, let's The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.